On today's PropTech VC podcast, we're joined by Matt Jafoon, the co-founder of Occupier. They've raised $16 million in venture capital, and they're pioneering the future of lease management and helping real estate executives make smarter real estate decisions. Matt, it's been a while since we spoke. How are you? I'm doing well, Zane. Thanks for having me on the show. Really appreciate it. So, Matt, tell us a bit about your background and how you ended up here as the co-founder of a fast-growing venture-backed startup. I, I have a professional background in commercial real estate. So I graduated from college in uh, 2003 with really no real plans of what I wanted to do with my life. Um, I guess that's what you get with a liberal arts education, um, but it does prepare you to you know, be resilient and, and figure things out on your own. So uh, I figured out that I wanted to get into the real estate industry. Um, I didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do, um, but I knew that I wanted to be on the commercial side, whether that was in development or leasing or property management or whatever. And I ended up working at JLL, which um, is you know one of the big boys in, in commercial real estate services globally. My first job there was as a uh, tenant rep analyst. So essentially corporations that uh, relied on JLL to manage their uh, real estate portfolios would uh, hire us to execute their transactions. Each one of those transactions has an underlying cash flow, uh, some analysis that has to go into, okay, how much money do we spend? What's my CapEx? What's my rent? How does that compare to the market? How does that compare to other buildings? I was basically the spreadsheet jockey uh, for all the brokers that were doing the deals. Uh, so I did that for a couple of years and then I graduated and becoming a broker myself uh, where I spent most of my time uh, representing tenants and landlords in their lease negotiations. It was like a hybrid sales role, but also a client service role where you're you know, actively uh, advising people um, through a process that is usually foreign to them to some degree. We'll get back to that and how that, uh, that uh, led me to doing what I'm doing. But I felt in around 2014 that the industry still ne- it needed a lot of modernization. Like we had all sorts of CRM tools and technology at JLL. Some were great, but the vast majority of it was not really purpose built for how brokers would work. And I, I just thought there was a lot of innovation runway in the space. Um, so rather than try to change JLL myself, I went and worked at a company called BTS, which um, at the time was pivoting from like a video touring kind of marketing software platform, which they're actually doing again now, which is awesome, into more of like a data management uh, SaaS, uh, leasing and asset management software platform. And I thought that was something that was sorely needed in our industry. Um, so I went and worked at BTS. I stayed there for a little more than uh, four years. Um, I met some great people there. Uh, that was kind of my startup MBA, kind of learned how a company scales from that series A and on. And I really actually cut my teeth from like an enterprise sales perspective there as well. Uh, learned how to sell software in uh, complicated uh, deals. But while I was working there, um, it became clear to me that while BTS was being a, uh, building a great product that was super valuable and sticky for its users, it was only addressing uh, one half of the market. And that was the landlord, um, which is a huge market and it's a huge, you know, multi-trillion dollar asset class. But um, the tenants that occupy commercial space uh, were also sorely under um, served by technology. Um, so just started scratching the itch of what would it be like if you know tenants had a, um, a central kind of infrastructure software that they could use uh, to make their real estate decisions, whether those are transactional, their portfolio management, or you know just generally uh, centralizing their work. So I'll, I'll pause there because that's when we started uh, thinking about Occupier seriously. And that was about uh, four years ago uh, that we jumped into startup land. Thank you for that. You, you mentioned um, 2014, you felt the industry needed a lot of innovation. We're here now and we're at 2022. <laughs> A lot of people still feel the same way. Firstly, how, how so do you, I? <laughs> so you feel the same way? A lot of folks in prop tech feel that this industry is ripe for disruption, but it's getting tiring hearing this for years yeah. and years and years. Are we at that cusp of major change? Did COVID accelerate that and bring that? Or are things just gonna continually, you know, being slow with, with adoption? Like, let's unpack that. Yeah. To tell us more about what you feel and why. Well, yeah, I think I think there's two questions in there. One is, has the industry, you know, made it up the learning curve? And two is like, what are what's changing that's going to make it, you know, really, you know, flip into a modern industry like, you know, stock bro- stockbrokers used to, you know, trade on paper, right? Now it's all, you know, uh, algorithmic trading, right? Will that ever happen in commercial real estate? Nah, I don't know. But if you bring it back like to 2014, I would say prop tech started becoming an actual investable category by you know venture capital in like 2000 
10, 11, 12, right? So it's about 10 years since PropTech has been a thing. Um, and I think the, the misnomer is that everyone's trying to disrupt commercial real estate. I don't think that, I mean, I don't even think that's the first phase of what PropTech is. I think PropTech is actually bringing technology to commercial real estate. And it's a huge, huge industry. There's multi sectors of it, right? There's commercial, there's multifamily, there's pretty much anything that is an asset um, it could be defined as real estate in some sense. So each one of the corners of that industry needs to be innovated and innovation is constant, right? It just so happens that real estate is one of the, like the last corners of industry that hasn't been innovated yet. And on top of that, I think that up until now, and I think the pandemic has accelerated this and we can get into that too, most of the capital that's been poured into prop tech has been focused on um, owners, property owners, landlords, the physical world. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that the tenants, the people that are occupying space and creating workspaces, using it to sell goods, to distribute um, goods have largely been ignored. And that was kind of the force that, or, or that was the thesis that we had when we started this business. Um, and then, so the second part of your question, I think is, has the pandemic, is that going to be the black swan event that just makes everybody, you know, light bulb, like we got to figure this out. And I think the answer is yes, because the vast majority of our customers who are all tenants, commercial tenants, um, have used this, uh, moment in time to really evaluate, like, how are we actually managing the second lar largest expense on our balance sheet? Like holy crap, we had all these thousands of people working in our offices. We just paid the rent and gave them a desk. And now they're all working from home. Now they're demanding things from us. None of them want to come back. Some of them do. Um, they want to be remote. They want to have a different work experience. And now if you want to unpack that from a traditional real estate sense, like, well, we also have all these leases that were, uh, you know, confined in. What do we do with all the information in those leases? How do we negotiate out of them? How do we re-strategize our portfolio so it suits the needs of the new employee? So it, unless you have like a technology backbone uh, that you're using for all of those decisions, it's going to be really hard to make sense of anything. So, and, and the reason is because there's so many constituents within a business that touch that real estate decision. It's the C-suite, it's the real estate department itself, it's the finance team, it's human resources, it's the business unit owners that have to occupy that space. So it, it's just this kind of mushrooming problem right now. Um, so I think the timing is right for a platform like or ours to come in and be that like infrastructure software, you know, for a business to make its real estate decision. So I know I threw a lot back at you there. If you want to unpack that a little more, I'm happy, you know, we, we can, we can dive into some of the, the questions of like, you know, people who keep like, saying, yeah. It feels like, and I'm, I'm familiar with the company just for the viewers context. So I can probably dig deeper here. I, I regrettedly didn't invest in, in Occupy and they've done fantastically well. And you know, that's just the nature of venture capital, right? You, you're going to miss amazing companies when you have good deal flow. And this is an example, but what do you think about an opinion I have as a venture capitalist who's investing in PropTech? To me, it feels like if you're going in and you there is an existing budget in place already for a specific problem the company's trying to solve, and when you have that situation, they already have a lot of solutions because everyone's going after the easy fixes. There isn't much of an incentive to go adopt a new player, even if the value proposition is superior. I don't mean disruptive. Disruptive value proposition is, you know, 10x better or, you know, it's like yeah. a huge discount on the cost. Whereas when you have a new set of problems that the world industry has never dealt with, let's take workplace uh, occupancy, for example, here. You've never had this situation where a large part of your real estate suddenly needs to be repurposed and a large contingent needs to work from home and you've now got this portfolio and you need to figure out what you're gonna do with it. When you have those types of problems that emerge, new problems where there isn't even an existing budget for it, you know, it doesn't really fall under lease administration. This is like a whole new area. That's where the massive big opportunities are. Whereas when you're going after, and it's annoying to hear for founders who are trying to figure out, you know, let me go build a company where there's all these 10, 20 problems. Well, the problem is there's lots of solutions around Ready. So my opinion is when there's a, a disruption in the industry and there isn't yet a clear budget defined for it, that's where there can be very large opportunities. Whereas when you're going after the areas that are well defined and there's competitors already, it's kind of hard to switch out competitive products because people are just comfortable with what they have. I mean, a lot of people use Excel and it's hard to convince them to get off Excel even. Well, what, yeah. What's your thoughts on all that? 
I, I, I semi agree with you, although okay, I think there are then, sleep. Sure. <laughs> I think there are sleeping industries, and I think ours is one of them where somebody can come in and really unseat the incumbent way of doing things, even though there might already be budget allocation for a, a, a type of software like that. And I think it's about market timing. Like, let's just talk about our company as an example of that. So when we started the company, we knew that there were already kind of legacy solutions in the market that have been adopted for lease administration, for example. We also knew that the lease accounting changes that were coming down the pipe for every company to comply with were super complex. And yeah, there was already a few things on the market that did that. They've been around for a while. But we also knew that people weren't that happy with those solutions. They were like web 1.0. Uh, they were either like super point solution. They only um, worked for like one user persona within a business. <laughs> we started the company two years before the pandemic. So we didn't actually, obviously we couldn't forecast that. Uh, that just kind of helped our cause, you know, uh, as perverse as that may sound. But I think if you looked at, if you looked at the, the forces that were happening in our market, that's what creates that opportunity for us to come in and be, uh, different than everything that everybody's seen so far. Um, and part of it is just general, basic, uh, building a better mousetrap. Like we have a much more user-friendly platform than anybody that we compete with. We deploy it faster. It's much more intuitive. So if you are asking somebody at a high-tech company that's less than 10 years old to buy software, they're going to buy the one that feels like an iPhone. I open the box and I know how to use it. They're not going to want to buy the one that you have to open 10 windows to get the, to the report that you want. So, I mean, that's what we're competing against. And of course, Excel, you know, every, every SaaS company competes with Excel in some fashion. Um, so if I was raising money and my value proposition was like, oh, we're just gonna get people off of spreadsheets. If I was the VC on the other side of the table, I'm like, I've heard that a million times. Like what's changed in your industry that make is gonna make everybody buy this? And then I think the other part of it is like just the sheer size of the market you're going after. Ours is massive because of these lease accounting changes had essentially are forcing every company to understand their underlying real estate. And if those are, if all the data that drives that function is locked up in PDFs uh, leases, then you're, you're never gonna even understand, forget about the pandemic, like you just have to understand what you have. I think Deloitte made a study about two years ago that said that 58% of companies still have all of their lease documentation on paper. So, I mean, just right there, there's a huge opportunity to digitize um, a major function within a business. Um, so I just, I, I, the part I disagree with, with your um, thought is that I don't think you need a massively disruptive business model to come in and build a big company. I think you just need to do something like really, really well that solves real world problems for users. And the more users you can solve for, the more sticky your product is within that enterprise. And if you're good at selling that, I think you can build a big business.